to one of the most complicated elements of the firsts. And that is the idea of a people who committed all sorts of horrific things after the Prophet ﷺ received revelation and then made tawbah while the Prophet ﷺ was still alive. Now, we've been speaking about the massacres of Bi'r Ma'una and Ar Raji'r, these two massacres that happened immediately after Uhud, and we spoke about some of the famous shuhada, the famous martyrs. I hope, inshallah, ta'ala, some of those names are well ingrained in your hearts and minds now. But this is the plot twist I was talking about a few weeks ago. Imagine being someone who killed one of those people and then having to face the Prophet وسلم, knowing the pain that you caused him. Imagine meeting the Prophet وسلم, and praying behind him knowing that he prayed against you. Imagine knowing that you caused the Prophet وسلم, to cry. Imagine walking into Masjid Nabawi and I seriously want you to think about this. Praying next to the son of a man you killed. Talk about complex and how things are unfolding. So there are so many different dimensions to put together here. Now SubhanAllah, you know, and I'm going to start from this place. I remember um, speaking to someone who was a prison guard where the only person who was caught in the assassination of Malcolm X rahimullah ta'ala al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz rahimullah dwelt. Uh, his, his name was Hayer, I forget the first name. But I remember the prison guard mentioning that this man, and it's known that he became Muslim, he became a Sunni Muslim in prison. So imagine, subhanAllah, he killed Malcolm, or he's one of the people that pulled the trigger on Malcolm, rahimahullah, knowing that he carries the guilt of that assassination, and then he made tawbah in prison. And he was talking about how this man lived such a sulkin life, that the way the man would cry and walk around and, and look empty, like imagine carrying that burden. Did Allah forgive me? Did He not forgive me? How could I have been responsible for putting bullets into one of the most influential men in what I now know to be the religion of truth. Think about that guilt, right? That burden of guilt. And I want you to imagine the community of the companions. And SubhanAllah, this is where I hope you can appreciate for a moment that hadith about the man who killed 99 people and then killed 100 because the man who he went to ask if he could ever be forgiven for killing 99 people told him after 99 people and he killed him too and him finding tawbah, hal li tawbah, do I have a chance at being forgiven? Imagine how that landed upon those companions. You know, this is a reality that is distant from many of us. We don't really understand, but if you are someone who comes from a troubled past, and I've met people like this, and there are communities, subhanAllah, where there are people that have body counts, they killed multiple people before they became Muslim. And they live with a sense of guilt and a, a sense of questioning and insecurity. Did Allah really forgive me because I said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? So imagine being someone who killed multiple Sahaba, and now you're a Sahabi, and hearing the Prophet ﷺ tell you the story about a man who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave after killing a hundred people. That hadith lands differently for those types of people. Is there tawbah for the greatest transgression that exists after a shirku billah? After associating a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet ﷺ said, the first thing that Allah will ask about on the Day of Judgment is a dam as it relates to the people, blood, those who shed blood. And now these people have to come to the Prophet ﷺ and find a sense of tawbah. That's one. So from the perspective of the person who committed these unspeakable crimes. Two, imagine being the son of a shaheed at Uhud or the daughter of a shaheed at Uhud. And you have to forgive and pray next to people that killed your family members. And by the way, the Prophet ﷺ is at the head of them. Rasulullah is sitting in front of the people who chewed the liver of his uncle Hamza radiallahu anhu and spit it out. He's sitting in front of these people and he forgives them alayhi salatu wasalam. But how do you carry that guilt? Or how do you carry that pain if you are the person on the other side when someone next to you participated in that? This is subhanAllah one of the things that makes the community of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so profound. When Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Allah fabeena qulubi kum fa asbahtum bi nirmatihi ikhwana," Allah Azza wa Jal brought your hearts together and you became brothers. 
that that was an impossible feat for mankind to do amongst themselves, for human beings to do amongst themselves. It is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that look what he did with you, O community of companions, that after all of this, he brought you together, and he caused you to love each other, and you became brothers and sisters in Islam, and you ended up fighting alongside each other in the glory days of Islam. How incredible, how amazing, what a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, this is also where we find the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentions that Allah Azza wa Jal laughs at two people. Two people who meet in Jannah. Al-Qatil wal maqtul The murdered meets his murderer in Jannah and says, what are you doing here? How in the world did you make it? <laughs> Because the last memory that they have of that person in dunya before they came to Jannah is that person cursing them or putting a sword in them or putting a spear in them, spitting at them, cursing Islam. And then talk about the awkwardness of bumping into that person in Jannah. You're here. Now it's not a grudge because there are no grudges in Jannah. There's no hate. There's no like, oh no, wait, I have to go talk to Allah. We've got to get you out of here. It's done. But it's a shock. And Allah Azza wa Jal is looking at these two slaves of his in Jannah and Allah Azza wa Jal laughs at these two people as they bump into each other in Jannah for the first time, surprised. How is it that you got here? So SubhanAllah, when we come to these stories of Ma'una and Ar-Raji' like Uhud, many of those who participated in these massacres did in fact become Muslim, did in fact repent to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. Now every single one of them though has an individual story and has a process by which they come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You may remember that we talked about Suhail ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Suhail ibn Amr did not become Muslim for a long time, but he resembled the earliest Muslims in his piety when he eventually did. He was an incredible person. And if you would have seen him in Hudaybiyyah and the way he tortured his son and all those things, you'd say, this guy has no chance of being guided to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you would have seen him after, you'd say, this is one of the best Muslims. He resembles in his zuhd, in his asceticism, in his ibadah, the earliest Muslims. So everyone has a process by which that all unfolded for them. Some of them indeed repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or accepted Islam in Fatih Mecca. And that's a large group of them. When Mecca is now under the Prophet Sallallahu and there is no more reason to fight the Prophet Sallallahu or fight Islam. And Allah knows the hearts of every single person. And we do not put ourselves above any single one of those people. رضي الله عنهم أجمعين. May Allah be pleased with them all. But some of them had an earlier process. So before we get to the person that we're speaking about today, I mentioned, subhanAllah, that after these two massacres of Ma'una and al rajia the Prophet ﷺ made dua against these tribes. As tribes, every single salah for a month in his qunut, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, did the dua strike them? Those tribes had all sorts of revolts within them. Some of the chiefs that participated in the betrayal of the Prophet ﷺ were killed by their own family members. There were natural disasters that came upon them, all sorts of things that struck them. And of course, the victory of Islam over them as a whole. Okay, So that's one way in which the dua of the Prophet ﷺ indeed strikes them. But some of them, Allah Azza wa Jal saw that their hearts were worthy of Islam. And just like us, when we make dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Allah Azza wa Jal answers it in the best possible way. Sometimes Allah gives you better than what you asked for. And so those people coming to the Prophet ﷺ and embracing Islam is far more beloved to him. And Rasulullah ﷺ, when he makes dua against the people, he makes dua against the people that Allah restrains their harm from another group of people. But he is still rahmatan lil alameen. He's still a mercy to the world. ﷺ. And so he accepts their repentance when they come back to him ﷺ, in the worldly sense. And Allah accepts the repentance when they come back to him in the sense of the hereafter. So we talked about Uhud. We mentioned the women that were beating the drums. Hind bint Utbah, the wife of Abu Sufyan, she became Muslim in Fatah Mecca. Raita bint Munabbih, the wife of Amr ibn As, she became Muslim after Fatah Mecca. Sulafa bin Sa'ad, who wanted to have the head of Asim ibn Thabit to drink out of his head, became Muslim after Fatah Mecca. 
So this is an interesting category of people. And many of those people, or a few of those people, I should say, converted to Islam sometime between the crime and the conquest of Mecca. And this is where you start to hone in on some of these categories. There are some people that embraced Islam sometime between Uhud and between Fatah Mecca. Now I want to speak about today, inshaAllah ta'ala, one person in particular, subhanAllah, who is one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Not just someone that you just put to the side. One of the best companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who fits that category, radiAllahu ta'ala anhu. But before that, I want to put you in Medina, and I want you to imagine sitting next to an old man in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the man has one narration in the books. He doesn't have three ahadith, he doesn't have ten. He has one narration. You know, subhanAllah, if you see someone and you don't know their story, they're an elderly person, and you can tell maybe they had a rough past or something like that, you have this man sitting in the masjid, and he has one thing that he says about himself. Here's the one way that he describes himself. His name is Jabbar ibn Salma. Jabbar ibn Salma. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the only thing that he says about himself he says, Inna mimma da'ani ila al-Islam anni ta'antu rajulan minhum yawma idin bil-rumhi bayna katafayhi. He said, the only thing that brought me to Islam or of what brought me to Islam was that I was the one that took a spear and put it right between the shoulders of a man on that day from the Muslims. فَنَظَرْتُ إِلَى سِنَانِ الرُّحِ And I looked at the end of that spear. I put my spear all the way through him. SubhanAllah, he's giving you vivid details and he's telling you about who he was before Islam. And as I go in front of him and the blood is coming from his mouth as I stabbed him with my spear and he's dying, he looks up and he says, Fustu Allah, Fustu Allah. I have succeeded by Allah, I have succeeded by Allah. That man was Amr ibn Fuhayra. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the guide of the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu on the Hijrah. And he is one of those who was massacred in Bi'r Ma'una. And Jabbar ibn Salma says, I was the one. I mean, subhanAllah, you're sitting in the masjid. I'm the one that did that to him. I put a spear between him and I looked at him as, as his soul left his eyes. And he said, Fustu Allah, I have succeeded by Allah. And you know what he says? He says, Qultu fi nafsi, kayfafas. I kept saying to myself after I did that, what is he talking about? How did he succeed? What did he succeed with? I killed him. He's dead. How did he succeed? And he goes home and you can imagine the nightmares and the images and replaying that incident in his head over and over and over again. He said, until I went to some of the Muslims, I was so lost as to what the man meant when he said, Fustu. I have succeeded by Allah. What did he see? I saw him in front of me when I was killing him. So they said to me, a shahada. He succeeded because he was martyred. He succeeded because he attained a shahada. And I said to myself, if this is what these people have, wallahi, he succeeded. Indeed, that is success. And Jabbar ibn Salma goes to Medina after Bi'r Ma'una. Imagine, presents himself to the Prophet Wasallam. The man who stabbed, the one who guided the Prophet and Abu Bakr anhu along the hijrah is now coming to Medina, making his own hijrah, saying to the Prophet وسلم, that was me. Halli tawbah. Will Allah ever forgive me? And the Prophet وسلم, accepts him into his community. And Jabbar ibn Salma is a quiet sahabi. SubhanAllah, this is the complexity of that community. He's a quiet sahabi. He prays amongst the companions. And that's his story. Who am I? I'm the one that stabbed a man, put a spear right, right through his chest and looked him in the eyes as he said, Fustu Allah, I have succeeded by Allah. And that's what made me Muslim, SubhanAllah. Now I want to enter into this, the man that we're going to be speaking about today, inshaAllah ta'ala, in detail. One of the most amazing companions of the Prophet Wasallam. His name is Saeed ibn Amr al-Jumahi. Saeed ibn Amr al-Jumahi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And I want to put up his uh, family tree, inshaAllah ta'ala, for a moment and talk a little bit about who he is so that you can understand a bit about his background. Saeed ibn Amr al-Jumahi is from the tribe of Banu Abdi Shams. 
Now the two military, main military families, right, and it's a sub-tribe, Banu Umayyah and Banu Abd al-Shams are, are the ones that are sort of in charge of leading all of the military campaigns of Quraysh, on behalf of Quraysh. They're two of the most senior tribes of Quraysh. And Sa'id was a young man. Now his siblings also embraced Islam. Uh, you don't have to look at that long line. This is only for those that are actually really interested in subhanAllah reading about the history of a person. But his sibling, one of them is Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. She embraced Islam, Fatima bint Amr. And the other one is a man by the name of Jamil. And Jamil is the grandfather, the great grandfather of Nafir ibn Abdullah, one of the greatest scholars of hadith in history. So you can just see the way that Islam kind of spreads through. Uh, this family. Uh, Waqi' ibn Jarrah, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, they narrate from Nafi' ibn Abdullah. So this is his great grandfather, Jamil ibn Amr. So all three of the kids become Muslim. Now, there's an interesting link I want you to pay attention to. His father dies before Islam, and his mother, Arwa, is the sister of Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. Now, if you remember one of the worst moments of the Prophet's life was when Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt came to the Prophet ﷺ when he was praying in Mecca and he dumped camel guts and intestines on his back and collapsed him under all of the filth of the camel. And the people laughed at the Prophet ﷺ and mocked him and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha came and she was scraping off the camel guts and crying as she was taking it off of the back of the Prophet ﷺ. This is after the death of Khadija radiallahu anha, after the death of Abu Talib. And the Prophet ﷺ is alone and his daughter, think about how humiliated is. he is وسلم, His daughter is moving the guts from his back والسلام, and he's always honored وسلم, and he's comforting Fatima radiallahu anha as this man seeks to humiliate him That is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt. So you understand the family of Sa'id ibn Amr, that's his uncle, okay? And his uncle is a staunch enemy of the Prophet ﷺ and his uncle was killed in Badr, all right? And he had sworn to harm the Prophet Sallallahu and he was someone who was filthy with the Prophet Sallallahu He is the person who, يَوْمَ يَعَضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اكْتَخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا that, uh, that person who's biting his fists on the Day of Judgment and saying, I wish I would have followed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I wish I never took that person as a friend, I wish I would have taken the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a friend instead, that's him, it's talking about him. So this is Sa'id's uncle. So his family is a family that has a lot out against the Prophet ﷺ. And his tribe, uh, Banu Abdi Shams, is in fact the tribe of Hind bint Utbah, right? Hind who cut the, the, the liver of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu and chewed it out. So he's not someone who himself has a particular reason to go after the Prophet ﷺ and, you know, in the wake of Uhud. He's a younger man, but his tribe has a lot of vitriol against the Prophet ﷺ and they're leading the charge against Islam. Now, why is this important? Because Sa'id starts his story of Islam from the date of the crucifixion of Khubayb Now, let this man tell you his story of Islam. Sa'id was someone who was oblivious to it all. He didn't fight in Uhud against the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't fight in Badr. He was a young man. but. He says, I remember the mobs going out to Tan'im for the crucifixion of Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This was a big deal, the crucifixion of Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so he said, I came out. And he said, I watched as they dragged Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu and they beat him and the people screamed at him. And I was staring at Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu the whole time. And he starts to recount the narration. He said, and I remember when Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, let me pray two rak'ahs. And he prayed two rak'ahs. And he said that if I didn't want you to get the pleasure of thinking that I was afraid, I would have increased in those two rak'ahs. If I didn't want you to think that I was delaying my death, I would have kept on praying. And he said, and I remember when they strung him up onto the cross and they were beating him and the blood was dripping from him. And they were asking him, would you like that Muhammad ﷺ be in your place? And Khubayb radiallahu anhu responded that I would rather, or I would not want the Prophet ﷺ to even be struck by a thorn. I would rather this than the Prophet ﷺ be touched by a thorn. And he said, and I remember as they were beating him and yelling at him, and they were saying, iqtulu, iqtulu. Imagine being in the front of the mob and the people are shouting, kill him, kill him. 
and they cut his body parts piece by piece and I was watching. So he's not participating as much, except that maybe I carried some of the wood, but I wasn't participating in killing him, but I was there with the mobs. It's my family that's a part of doing this to him. And then Khubayb makes the dua, Allahumma ahsihim adada wa qtulhum badada wa la tughadir minhum ahada. Oh Allah, count them all and kill them one by one and do not spare. Wa la tabqa aw wa la tughadir minhum ahada. Do not spare a single one of them. And Sa'id remembered the power of Khubayb's dua. Remember, Abu Sufyan threw Muawiyah to the ground. The people hit the ground because of the power in his voice, even though he was dying when he made dua against them. This is the beginning of Sa'id's Islam. Sa'id ibn Amr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, so I went home that night and I kept on replaying over and over and over again the murder of Khubayb and my participation. I was there and he made dua against me and I saw the conviction that he had, the strength that he had, the faith that he had, like nothing shook the man, everything they did to him. And he said, eventually I couldn't handle myself. So I went out to Quraysh and I called out to them and I said, Ya Ma'ashar Quraysh, O assembly of Quraysh, inni bari'un mimma fa'altum bi Khubayb. I have nothing to do with what you did with Khubayb. Wa inni bari'un minkum, I have nothing to do with any of you. And I am free from your idol worship. And I'm free from your sorcery. And I'm free from your oppression. I want nothing to do with any of you anymore. And he said, and I made my way to Medina. He's a very interesting person. Why? Because most people, you know, if you look at sort of the, the bulk of people or, or the bunches of people that are embracing Islam, right? You have these batches of people that embrace Islam at certain parts of the seerah. There is a batch after Khaybar. There is a batch after Hudaybiyah. There is the biggest batch after Fatah Mecca, after the conquest of Mecca. Sa'id is interesting in that he will make his way to Medina to embrace Islam before Khaybar. It's an awkward time period because it's the lowest time period of the Prophet This is when the Prophet and his community were most vulnerable. And Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually wants to go and embrace Islam at this point. And that is a sign of his sincerity. And even Allah Azzawajal mentions time periods count here. لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة من الذين أنفقوا من بعد وقاتلوا وكلا وعد الله الحسنى Allah says it in Surah Al-Hadid that those who embraced Islam after the Fath are not equal to those that embraced Islam before it. Those that did it before and fought alongside the Prophet ﷺ and spent and sacrificed as a group of people, they're not like those who came after. Now everyone has their individual circumstance with Allah but as a group, those people are different. So Sa'id makes the cutoff he meets the cutoff of before Fatih Hudaybiyah or Fatih Mecca. And at the same time, he has blood on his hands from the Sahaba, which is very rare. So he's, a, he's in a very different situation when he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So imagine being in Medina, and you now have to deal with Jabbar ibn Salma, who murdered the head of the group that you sent to Ma'una, Amr ibn Fuhayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and you have a man who participated in the crucifixion of Khubayb ibn Adi radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, from the Hadith al Rajir, from the massacre of al Rajir. And Sa'id ibn Amr comes to the Prophet sallallahu and he tells the Prophet sallallahu what happened with Khubayb. He recounts the story. And he tells the Prophet sallallahu what he told his people. Do I have a chance at repentance? Right? I mean, these are the people who needed that hadith of the man who killed 99 and 100 people. We all need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tawabur rahim, that Allah is the acceptor of repentance and the forgiving. But these people really needed that particular hadith of a man who committed multiple murders, but still was forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now subhanAllah, what about Khubayb radiallahu anhu? And Khubayb radiallahu anhu and Sa'id radiallahu anhu bump into each other in Jannah. Didn't I make dua against you people? Imagine, subhanAllah, that of the good deeds of Khubayb is the Islam of Sa'id. And we're going to talk about all the great things that Sa'id will do in Islam. His last act, even in death, was da'wah. His last act, even in death, was da'wah. Jab Jabbar ibn Salma radiallahu anhu died very quietly. Sa'id radiallahu anhu is going to go on to do amazing things in Islam. 
Khubayb radiallahu anhu was giving da'wah to the man even while he was being crucified and didn't even know it. So what would be more beloved to Khubayb than knowing that you extended your legacy through this man as well, even as he was participating in your murder. So Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes and one of the things that Sa'id immediately distinguishes himself by is zuhud, is asceticism. Now Banu Abd shams uh, they're a pretty rich, pretentious people. Okay, I didn't want to lose you all with the family tree, but Fatima, his sister, is married to the uncle of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Mughira ibn As. Uthman comes from this tribe radiallahu ta'ala anhu. They were rich people, they were wealthy, they were the nobles of Mecca, the elites of Mecca. And now, Sa'id radiallahu anhu comes and he basically takes on the approach of Ahl al-Sufa. He decides to absolve himself of this dunya altogether. He's very interesting in that regard. He doesn't want the wealth of this world. He doesn't need to be bought. He doesn't need to be sort of softened up into Islam. I don't want any of it. So Sa'id radiallahu anhu becomes famous for az zuhd And that's why you'll even find that some of the Mufassirun, when they talk about وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ بِتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ that there, there are those that have sold themselves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they've given their souls for the sake of Allah, that Sa'id is one of those people. He resembles these people who completely came to the Prophet and said, I am done with this world. I am dedicating myself to you. So he fought alongside the Prophet in Khaybar. He fought alongside the Prophet in all of the battles that come after, and he dedicates himself in that sense. And he was a skilled uh, uh, warrior, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But he takes on the, uh, the identity of the poor ones of the Sahaba, of those that are known for their zuhd. And subhanAllah, there's very few, that's, that, that can, very few narrations that can be found from him. One narration of Tabarani, that Sa'id ibn Amr al-Jumahi, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he uh, says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ فُقَرَاءَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ يَزِفُّونَ كَمَا يَزُفُّ الْحَمَامِ فَيُقَالُ لَهُمْ قِفُوا لِلْحِسَابِ That on the day of judgment, that the poor people amongst the Muslims will be brought forth, lined up the way that the pigeons are lined up. Meaning they'll be brought forth in their groups. And then it will be said to them, قِفُوا لِلْحِسَابِ Now stand and go through your hisab. Be held accountable. فَيَقُولُونَ وَاللَّهِ مَا تَرَكْنَا شَيْئًا نُحَاسَبُ بِهِ they will say, Wallahi, we have left nothing behind that we can be held accountable for. Meaning we were poor people. فَيَقُولُ اللَّهُ جَلَّ جَلَالُ صَدَقَ عِبَادِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, My servants are telling the truth. فَيَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ قَبْلَ النَّاسِ بِسَبْعِينَ عَامًا And so they will enter Jannah before the people by 70 years. One narration which is more authentic, even 500 years. So the point is, is that they go before the people because on the Day of Judgment, they have nothing to be asked for. They have nothing to be asked about. They don't have any ni'am, any of the blessings, any of the money, the wealth that people will be asked about. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes it easy for us on the Day of Judgment. Allahumma ameen. So these are the poor people and Sa'id narrates that and Sa'id ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu wants to be amongst those people. So he immediately gains favor not just with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu and particularly gains a special relationship with Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And his relationship with Umar becomes a major focus in the history of Islam. Now, why does Umar radiallahu anhu love him? Number one, he hates materialism, even though he comes from a family of materialism. Number two, Sa'id carries himself with a lot of sincerity, with a lot of integrity, with a lot of taqwa, with a lot of piety. It wasn't easy to impress Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sa'id radiallahu anhu becomes one of those people who deeply impresses Umar radiallahu anhu and who gives Umar nasiha as well as takes nasiha from Umar. They actually have a relationship in which they will both advise one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have very little about his relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sa'id radiallahu anhu. But what we have is that he fought alongside the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he fits an awkward category which puts him really alone, where he killed in Raji' or participated in the murder, but then became Muslim long before most of those other people would become Muslim. Radiallahu ta'ala anil muslimin, anil sahabati ajma'in. 
So when the Prophet ﷺ passes away, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, puts him in charge of some of the battalions and he fights as a commander uh, in several expeditions and he's a close confidant of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And then when Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu passes away and Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu becomes the Khalifa, we find this relationship unfolds and this legacy of a man who carries on his conscience one of the greatest tragedies in history starts to unfold. First and foremost, one of the most beautiful advices that you will see to a leader is the advice that he will give to Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala anhu when Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala anhu uh, becomes the Khalifa. So when Umar anhu becomes the Khalifa, he says to him, Ya Umar, inni uridu an usiyak. He says, O oh, Umar, I want to give you some advice. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, of course, please give me advice. So he said to him, Usika an takhsha allaha fin nas wa la takhsha nasa fin lah. This is subhanAllah in and of itself, that sentence is very hard to translate by the way. Usika an takhsha allaha fin nas wa la takhsha nasa fin lah. I advise you, and usika is a very strong word, I advise you that you fear Allah in regards to the people and don't fear the people in regards to Allah. First and foremost, fear Allah in regards to the people. Do not fear the people in regards to Allah. وَلَا يَخْتَلِفَ قَوْلُكَ وَلَا فِعْلُكَ فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الْقَوْلِ مَا تَبِعَهُ الْفِعْلِ And do not let your words and your deeds have any discrepancy because the best words are the ones that are followed by deeds, by actions. SubhanAllah, think about this. I mean, imagine uh, who you have to be to tell Umar about radiallahu anhu about hypocrisy. Like to give Umar radiallahu anhu advice about hypocrisy means that you have to have a pretty significant position with him. So he says to him, don't let your words depart from your deeds and the best words are the ones that are followed by deeds. وَلَا تَقْضِي فِي أَمْرٍ وَاحِدٍ بِقَضَاءَيْنِ يَخْتَلِفُ عَلَيْكَ أَمْرُكْ وَتُنْزَعُ عَنِ الْحَقِّ وَخُذْ بِالْأَمْرِ ذِي الْحُجَّةِ So he says, and do not judge in a singular situation with two different judgments. Don't let your judgments conflict, right? Because then you might swerve from the truth. Always stick to the proof, to the truth. And Allah will help you and He will rectify your people on your hand. How significant, subhanAllah with what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Morocco and Libya and Indonesia, the tragedies, and of course the oppression. He says, and focus yourself on being just and being intent upon caring for those who Allah has put under you from the Muslims that are close to you and the Muslims that are very far away from you. They're all on you, O Umar. You have a, they have a right upon you wherever they are, O Umar. وَأَحِبَّ لَهُمْ مَا تُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِكَ وَأَهْلِ بَيْتِكَ And love for them what you love for yourself and for your family. وَكْرَهْ لَهُمْ مَا تَكْرَهُ لِنَفْسِكَ وَلِأَهْلِ بَيْتِكَ And hate for them what you hate for yourself and what you hate for your family. وَخُذِ الْغَمَرَاتِ إِلَى الْحَقِّ حَيْثُ عَلِمْتَ وَلَا تَتَّقِي فِي اللَّهِ لَوْمَ تَلَاءٍ Take the truth wherever it takes you and do not fear in the weight of Allah the blame of a blamer. SubhanAllah, imagine if this was uh, a constitution or something that we read to everyone who was given a position amongst the Muslims. The advice of Sa'id ibn Amr to Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them, when he took this position. Umar radiallahu anhu is someone who if you said, ittaqillah to him, he starts crying. <laughs> so what do you think I mean, happens to him when Sa'id gives him this type of advice? So Umar radiallahu anhu is overwhelmed. He says, وَمَنْ يَسْتَطِيعُ ذَلِكِ يَا سَعِيد Who in the world could do what you just said, O oh, Sa'id? Everything that you just mentioned, how in the world am I supposed to do that, O oh, Sa'id? Sa'id radiallahu anhu says, Mithluk, you, someone like you. Man wallahu allahu amra ummati Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa lam yaj'al baynahu wa baynahu ahada. You, O oh, Umar, a person like you, Allah put you in this position. Someone who Allah put in charge of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and did not put anything between him and Allah azza wa jal. It, it is you. I'm telling you to take what Allah has given you in haqq with haqq. Allah gave it to you because you deserve it. Now do justice by it, O Umar. 
Sahih Umar radiallahu anhu said, Allahul Musta'an. From Allah, all help is sought. This is again one of the most beautiful advices that we find from Sa'id to Umar. Now, Umar is going to repay the favor. If Umar likes you, he's going to make you a governor. And remember, Umar radiallahu anhu hates hypocrites and he hates materialists and he hates people who display a want for leadership. So many times in the seerah of Umar radiallahu anhu, you see him trying to make someone a governor and they're saying, please don't make me a governor. And Umar is saying, you're not just going to let me deal with this on my own. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu calls Sa'id forward radiallahu ta'ala anhu after the conquest of Al-Hims in Asham. Al-Hims. And Al-Hims, by the way, obviously one of the greatest cities in Asham of Syria uh, and of greater uh, Syria. And at that time, probably, you know, historians say probably the first city of Asham that had as large of a Muslim population as it did. Right? Because remember, the Muslims did not force people to convert to Islam, right? So many of them held on to their religion for some time. Hims had a huge Muslim population, and it was one of the centers of Asham. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, conquers Ash- uh, uh, Hims. Uh, of course, this is when the expedition is taking place with Asham, the battle between the Romans and uh, the Muslims. And you can actually pull up a picture of uh, the earliest picture of Hims just to give you the idea. And of course, Hims was uh, one of the cities that was destroyed in the revolution. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help the people of Hems today. Allahumma ameen. Make it easy for our brothers and sisters there. Allahumma ameen. But this is one of the earliest pictures of Hems. Historical city, beautiful city. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu calls forth Sa'id ibn Amr. And he says, I'm putting you in charge of Hems. Sa'id ibn Amr is a man who lives like a Zahid. He's completely away from the dunya. He's completely away from anything of this world, the material of this world. And he says, Ya Umar, O oh Umar, please, nashatuk Allah, la taftini. Don't put me to trial. Don't, don't let this be a fitna for me. I'm begging you by Allah. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, ghaliba, he got mad. He said, Wayhakum, wada'atum hadha al amr fi unuqi, thumma takhalaytum anni. He said, Woe to you. You people put this on my neck and then you left me alone? No, no, no. You're sharing this burden with me. You think I wanted to be Khalifa? You have to be the governor. And he's saying, please, O Umar, leave me to the masjid, leave me to my reading, leave me to my ibadah, leave me to my worship. I don't want anything to do with this. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Wallahi la ad'uka. <laughs> I swear by Allah, I will not leave you alone. SubhanAllah, think about how the things have changed. And by the way, there's so much to think about the relevance here. I will not leave you alone. You have to do this. I, you are a person who's suited for it. So Umar radiallahu anhu says to him, you're now in charge of Hims. Ma'asalama, you need to go to Hims. And he says to him after that, because uh, at the end of the day, he's Amir al-Mu'mineen. He's the commander of the believers. So Sa'id protested, but fine, I'll take it. He says to him, Ala nafridu laka rizqa? Do you want me to give you a salary? Do you need some money? Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, وَمَا أَفْعَلُ بِهِ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَإِنَّ عَطَائِي مِنْ بَيْتِ الْمَالِ يَزِيدُ عَنْ حَاجَتِي SubhanAllah, he said, I don't need any money, O Amir al-Mu'mineen. What I get, my monthly wage from Bayt al-Mal is more than what my expenses are. I'm okay. Umar radiallahu anhu didn't like bribery. He didn't want people to be corrupted. So he gave his governors a salary so that they would not be bought by their people. So that was one of his strategies and it was a wise thing for Umar radiallahu anhu to do to make sure that the governors were taken care of so that no one can bribe them, right? Sa'id says, I don't want the money, I'm okay. Baytul mal, what I get as a monthly wage is enough. Now subhanAllah, as he is sending him, he says to him, as he's bidding him farewell, قَالَ يَا سَعِيدِ إِنِّي إِنَّمَا أَبْعَثُكَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ لَسْتَ بِأَفْضَلِهِمْ وَلَسْتُ أَبْعَثُكَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِتَضْرِبَ أَبْشَارَهُمْ وَلَا تَنْتَهِكَ أَعْرَاضَهُمْ وَلَكِنَّكَ تُجَاهِدُ بِهِمْ عَدُوَّهُمْ وَتُقْسِمُ فِيهِمْ فَيْئَهُمْ said, listen, I'm sending you to a people and I'm not sending you to a people so that you could beat on their men or so that you could dishonor their people. I'm not sending you to be an oppressor. Don't go there with a stick in your hand, with a whip and start asserting yourself in charge of these people and start oppressing the people. That's not who I'm, how I'm sending you. You know, subhanAllah, the way they portray Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the justice of this man. I'm not sending you to beat people. I'm not sending you to dishonor people. I'm sending you to go there 
to fight alongside them. This is an active battle between the Muslims and the Romans here. To fight alongside them and at the same time that you can justly distribute the, uh, the, the spoils amongst them. So justly distribute their proportions amongst them. So Sa'id makes his way to Hims, uh, to Asham. Now Umar radiallahu anhu is getting his, uh, his reports. And Umar has two ways of getting reports. One of them is in Hajj, or if people come to him and he asks them about how people are doing in this region. The other one is that Umar just shows up in your city, <laughs> pops up in your living room, and starts asking the people about you and making sure that you're not taking anything, not stealing anything, and that the people have no complaints against you. So Umar has a two, two-tiered approach, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to checking on his governors. Everything he's getting from Hems is positive. Everyone comes forth and they keep talking about the justice and the goodness of Sa'id ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now Hims had a nickname by the way, uh, and so this is a way that, that the Iraqis and the Shamis will both get mad at me now. They called it Kuwaifa, Little Kufa. And the reason why they called it Kuwaifa, Little Kufa is because Kufa was known for too many complaints. And so Hims was known for Shakawi for a lot of complaints as well. So they used to call it Kuwaifa, the Little Kufa. Right? So it was shocking to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that you know, they all have good things to say about Sa'id ibn Amr. So he sends a letter uh, to Sa'id ibn Amr. He says, Inna ahl al-Shami yuhibbunak. It's like the people of Sham really love you. What do you think it is? Qala inni wa'awinuhum wa uwasihim. He said, because I'm there for them, I help them, and I comfort them when they are in need. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, He said to him, listen, here's 10,000 dinars from me to you. Give yourself a break, breathe a bit, because you're living in such hardship, and it's okay for you to at least have some comfort in your life. And he says to him, man huwa ahwaju ilayha minni. He said, you know, oh Umar, I'm going to give it to someone who needs it more than me. No, I don't want to do that. I'll, I don't need this 10,000. I'll give it to people that need it more uh, than me. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says to him, Inna Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a'atani. You know, one time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave me some money. فَقُلْتُ لَهُ مِثْلَ الَّذِي قُلْتُ And you know, I said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the same thing you just said to me. I said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't need it. I'll just go give it to the poor. And he said, فَقَالَ لِي عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ The Prophet ﷺ said to me, إِذَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ مَا لَمْ لَمْ تَطْلُبْهُ وَلَمْ تَشْرَهُ إِلَيْهِ نَفْسُكُ فَخُذْهُ فَإِنَّمَا هُوَ رِزْقٌ أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ بِهِ if, us, if someone gives you money and you didn't go seek it out, you didn't crave it inside, you didn't do anything for it, but it's just something that came your way, then take it, that is risk that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to you. Right? You don't have to torture yourself in this way. So he gave him something in that regard. And subhanAllah, the only complaint that he, that, or the only incident that we know of a back and forth between Sa'id ibn Amr and someone in Hims is that one time uh, someone called him a name, someone said something to him insulting. So subhanAllah, no one, no one ever is free from this, especially in a position of leadership. So someone sent a na- said something to him and he says, Man alladhi sammani bi ghayr al ismi alladhi sammani bihi walidi. Who's the person that, said, that called me a name that my father did not name me? He says, إِن كُنْتَ لَغَنِيًّا أَنْ تَلْعَنَكَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Look, uh, you could have protected yourself from being cursed by the angels. You really didn't need to get yourself cursed by the angels. وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Don't do that. Don't call people by, by bad nicknames. Don't mock people. You know, you could have protected yourself, saved yourself from giving away your good deeds to someone. Alright? Now, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu has another incident with him. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu one day was gathering the people from the different regions. So he said to them, give me the scrolls of your fuqara, of your poor people, so I can take care of them. And subhanAllah, as they give him the names of the fuqara, he sees the name of Sa'id ibn Amr. So Umar radiallahu anhu was like, is this a mistake? <laughs> he said to them, who is this? They said, our Amir. He said, Amirukum faqir. Your Amir is one of the poor people of Hams. Like, are you serious? You're putting your Amir in the, in the zakat collections? Like, what are you talking about? So they said to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they said, Wallahi, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. 
Sa'id ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes nights, long nights, وَلَا يُوْقَدُ فِي بَيْتِهِ نَارِ And no fire is lit in his home. The man doesn't eat. The man doesn't take anything. The man lives his life very, very, very poor. فَبَكَى عُمَرُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ بُكَاءً شَدِيدًا حَتَّى بَلَّتْ دُمُوعُهُ لِحْيَتِهِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ أو لِحْيَتَهُ Umar رضي الله عنه cried so much that his beard became wet. He started to weep رضي الله عنه. I mean, they know where these people came from. That man comes from Banu Abdi Shams in Mecca and he has given all that up and now he's in the scrolls of the poorest people in a region that he governs. And Umar رضي الله عنه starts to cry and cry and cry. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he goes and he gets a thousand dinars from himself. And he puts it in a pouch. And he says, go to Sa'id. Qra'u alayhi salam. Give him my salam. Wa qulu lahu yasta'inu bihada ala qada'i hawa'ijihi. Tell him to use this one thousand. This is from me to him. This isn't Baytul Mal. I'm giving him a thousand from me. Tell him to take care of his debts. Tell him to take care of whatever he needs. So subhanAllah, here's what happens. They come back to Sa'id ibn Amr, the governor, radiallahu ta'ala anhu of Asham. And they hand him the pouch and they say, this is from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He cried when he saw your name amongst the fuqara. He sends his salam and he says, take this to handle your debts. Sa'id goes, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. So his wife comes. And his wife says, Ma sha'nuk, amata amir al mu'mineen. What happened? Did Umar die? SubhanAllah, imagine the way he said, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. She thought that Umar bin Khattab died, that the news that came back from Umar radiallahu anhu is that he passed away. And Sa'id goes with it. He says, bal a'dhamu min dhalik. He said, no, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. It's worse than, worse than the death of Umar bin Khattab. She said, wa ma What is it? He said, دَخَلَتْ عَلَيَّ الدُّنْيَا لِتُفْسِدَ آخِرَتِي He said that something of this world has come into me or come into this home that has come to ruin my akhirah. وَحَلَّتِ الْفِتْنَةَ فِي بَيْتِي And then has brought fitna to my house. So she said, تَخَلَّصْ مِنْهَا She still has no idea what he's talking about. So she said, well get rid of it. If something came in your house, like is it a letter, is it a problem? If something came in your house that has, is going to ruin your akhirah, get rid of it. He said, that's the answer that I wanted. Hal tu'inani ala dhalik? Will you help me do that? She said, yes. So he takes out the 1,000 dinars. He says, help me put this into some envelopes or some bags and let's go distribute this to the fuqara. So she says, let's do it. <laughs> SubhanAllah. This is his character. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now SubhanAllah, what happens after this? And this is where the story all comes full circle. And it's one of the most touching stories that you find from Seer al-Sahaba, from, um, from the biographies of the companions. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes to Hims himself, to meet the people for the very first time, and to ask them about Sa'id ibn Amr. Remember, this is Kuwaifa. They complain a lot, right? He's expecting complaints. And they said to him, listen, Saeed is amazing. But we have four complaints about him. Four things we want to bring to your attention about him. Just these four complaints. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is a consistent man. What does Umar radiallahu anhu do when the people say we have a complaint about the governor? He brings the governor forward and he hears, the, he, he hears out their complaints. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, I even made a dua. I said, Allahumma inni a'rifuhu min khayri ibadik. Oh Allah, I know him to be of the best of your servants. Allahumma la tukhayyab fihi firasati. Oh Allah, don't let my, what I thought I saw in him be wrong. Like don't let my impression of him be wrong. He's so, I, I know him. Like Umar radiallahu anhu is someone who knows a good person when he sees him. I know him. Don't let it be wrong. So Umar radiallahu anhu calls Saeed and he calls the people forward. And he said, Saeed, they have four complaints about you. Tafaddalu. Go ahead. What are your complaints? They said, أَنَّهُ لَا يَخْرُجْ إِلَيْنَا حَتَّى يَتَعَالَ النَّهَارِ They said to him, first and foremost, he only comes out to us after the sun has already risen. Meaning he takes his time in the morning. He, he's a late morning guy. He prays Fajr with us, but he doesn't come to start taking care of our affairs until after the sun is high, until later on in the morning. 
So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says to Sa'id, Limada, why is it that that happens? Qala inni akrahu an aqula dhalik ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said, listen, I didn't want to talk about this, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, I hate to even put this out there. But he says to him, um, he says, Annahu la budda min tawdihihi, though I have to make it clear, فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لِأَهْلِ خَادِمٌ فَأَقُومُ الصُّبْحَ فَأَعْجِنُ لَهُمْ عَجِينَهُمْ ثُمَّ انْتَظِرَهُ يَخْتَمِرُ ثُمَّ أَقُومُ فَأَخْبِزَهُ لَهُمْ ثُمَّ أَتَوَضَّ وَأَخْرُجْ إِلَيْهِمْ He said that, look, we don't have anyone to help us out. We don't have a maid. Now, subhanAllah, back then, even a very poor person will have some khadim, someone that's helping them out, some sort of a maid. And he says, we don't have anyone in the house to help us out. We're very poor. So he said, every morning, I go out and I prepare the dough, and I bake the bread, I wait for it to rise, and then once I can give the, at least the bread to my family, he says, then I make wudu and I come out to the people and I start taking care of their affairs. Obviously, this is embarrassing for the people. Like, man, like we put him on the spot, and we said that, you know, he doesn't come out to us until later in the day. It's because he's so poor that he has to cook his own, he has to bake his own bread, and that's un unusual to them. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, all right, that's settled. Qala amma thaniya, he said, okay, people, what do you have next? What's your second complaint? Qalu annahu la yujibu ahadan bil Talk about entitlement. They said, he doesn't respond to us at night. He doesn't take our calls at night. All right, the governor doesn't listen to us at night. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, why don't you answer the people at night? And each one of these, subhanAllah, could be a dars, by the way, in terms of expectations and, and bandwidth and balance and all that kind of stuff. Why don't you answer them at night? I said, yeah, I mean, I really didn't want to talk about it. But he said, listen, قَدْ جَعَلْتُ النَّهَارَ لَهُمْ وَلِرَبِّيَ اللَّيْلِ He said, I have divided my life so that the daytime is for the people and the nighttime is for my Lord. That's my time of qiyam. So, yeah, I, I don't respond to them at night because I'm praying Qiyam al That's the time that I've given to my Lord and he made it as general as possible. My time for my Lord is the night time, my time for the people is during the day. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, that's settled. He said, Athalifa, what's your third complaint about him? So they then went on to say that أَنَّهُ لَا يَخْرُجْ يَوْمًا مِنْ كُلِّ شَهْرٍ SubhanAllah, he has one vacation day a month. Please do not treat your employees this way. There is one day of the month he doesn't come out to us. All right? So how dare he take one day off? <laughs> Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, Saeed, what is it? You don't come out to them one day. And he says, listen, I didn't want to say this, but he said, not only do I not have a khadim, I don't have anyone to take care of our stuff. He said, Laysa indi thiyabun ghayra lati alayya. He said, the only thobe I have is the one that I wear. So he says, فَأَنَا أَخْسِلُهَا فِي الشَّهْرِ مَرَّةِ وَأَنْتَظِرُهَا حَتَّى تَجِفْ He said, so I take the stove and I wash it. One day of the month at least, I have to wash it and I have to wait for it to dry up so I can come out to the people. So there's one day that I extensively clean the stove of mine. This is looking worse and worse for the people with their complaints. So every single one of them, he's like, I didn't want to talk about this, but you're making me talk about this. So that's the one day that I take off. The fourth one is the most touching. And it's the one that brings it all full circle. He said, what's the fourth one? Al-Rabi'ah. They said, أَنَّهُ تُصِيبَهُ غَشْيَةَ فِي بَعْضِ الْأَوْقَاتِ فَيَغِيبُ عَمَّنْ فِي الْمَجْلِسِ He said, sometimes he passes out in the middle of a majlis. So he'll be sitting with us and he just passes out. The man blacks out frequently. So it's not as much a complaint about him. It's, is he capable? We're worried about him. Is he having seizures? Why does he black out so frequently? And this is the one, subhanAllah, that would move Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu the most and move the people the most. He said, Saeed, what is it? Are you okay? Why are you blacking out in the middle of your gatherings? And he says, I was there when Khubayb was crucified. Inni hadartu masra'a Khubayb ibn Adi. Most of these people don't even know who Khubayb is. So I was there when Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu was killed. Kuntu Mushrik, and I was one of the polytheists. I was on the other side. And he said, and I watched Quraysh to qatti'u jasadahu, cutting up his limbs. I watched Quraysh cutting his limbs off and saying to him, Would you wish that Muhammad was in your place? 
And Khubayb responding and saying, Wallahi ma uhibbu an akuna aminan wa ahli wa waladi wa anna muhammadan tashukuhu shawka. He said, I would not want, I swear by Allah, for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be pricked by a thorn while I am safe with my family and with my health. So when Khubayb says this, subhanAllah, this is very tough. Why does he black out? He says, every time I remember that scene, إذا ذكرت ذلك المشهد وأني لم أنصره and that I did not help him when that was happening, ظننت أن الله لا يغفر لي. I'm afraid Allah won't forgive me. SubhanAllah, with everything that he has been through, I'm afraid Allah has not forgiven me for that moment. Can you imagine all that you've done now? You've got decades of Islam under your belt and helping the people and doing all of this and you've earned the favor of Abu Bakr and Umar after the Prophet ﷺ and now I worry that Allah will not forgive me. And when I worry that Allah will not forgive me, I pass out. SubhanAllah. And Umar anhu was emotional deeply moved because Umar is probably the only person in that gathering that gets it because he remembers what happened. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says to the people, leave this man alone. And he said, Alhamdulillah alladhi lam yukhayyib dhanni bik. All praises be to Allah who did not disappoint me with you. Who did not contradict what I knew of you to be true. So this is Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu spreading the greatness of Islam around the world but remembering that one moment where he participated in the crucifixion of Khubayb radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu anaka Sa'id, he hugs him, he embraces him and he comforts him in that moment. This is a human element, subhanAllah, that we just do not, we cannot possibly appreciate. What do you do when you have companions that killed companions and that spent their whole lives wondering if Allah would forgive them or not? And the reality is, is that it's actually a driver in his life. It becomes a driver that keeps him going. It becomes a driver that keeps him wondering if he's ever been forgiven and keeps him doing good for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing I'll share is one more story between him and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu because we've reached time. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu once again got the report from the people of Hems that Khubayb is uh, poor. Khubayb doesn't have anything. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu sends to him a thousand dinars again. And he says, listen, this is from me. Please, please take care with these 1,000 dinars. Do what you need to do to handle your debts. So his wife sees it and his wife says, Alhamdulillah, we can take care of these debts. This is after years now and being in hardship. And Saeed looks to her and says, وَهَلْ لَكِ what if we do something better with this money? She said, what is that? He said, That we will give it to those that come to us, even if we need it more than them. And We'll loan it to Allah as a beautiful loan. And she said, Naam, وَجُزِيتَ خَيْرًا Yes, and may Allah reward you. فَمَا قَامَ مِنْ مَجْلِسِهِ حَتَّى وَزَعَهَا رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ عَلَى الْأَيْتَامِ وَالْأَرَامِلِ وَالْمَسَاكِينِ And so he did not stand up رضي الله عنه until him and his wife, they became famous for putting these envelopes together, these pouches together, by which they passed it out to the poor. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with Sa'id ibn Amr al-Jumahi رضي الله تعالى عنه. He died under Umar ibn Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه his khilafah in the year 19 after Hijrah. In Al Hims, and he's buried in Al Sham. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him and be pleased with all of the companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to understand the incredible power of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as the incredible power of a person who is seeking redemption in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah azza wa jal forgive us for all of our sins, and may Allah azza wa jal join us with these incredible, magnificent companions and be pleased with them. May Allah send His peace and blessings upon our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, His family and companions. Allahumma ameen. InshaAllah Ta'ala, I will see you all next week. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh. Nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.